Um, I get where you're coming from, but like I like how I see it is like I'm going to respect you. Like how when me me and you first met, I introduced myself, but I'm not going to go out of my way to make sure I'm super nice to you, in a sense. Like I'm going to give you a decent like my standard respect, but I'm not going to respect you like I do my idol or like my mother because my mother has earned that respect in a sense. If that makes sense. I think for me, it's more like the difference between treating someone with respect and treating someone with authority. Because I think, especially in the South, people treat like respect like it should be authority, like adults especially. Um, but I think there should always be a basis of respect unless they lose that respect in some regard. So like, oh. I'm always going to be polite. But like, I think that's what you're getting. At. You're going to be polite to someone if they prove a reason why you shouldn't be. Yeah, I was under, I was not saying that I don't agree with you, Ryan. I was just making sure mine was clear. I completely agree with you that, like, everyone is going to be treated with, like, a certain standard of respect. That's what I'm understanding that, like, it's, and it was the way I was taught, was I'm going to go up to someone and say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I do that to strangers all the time, but I'm not going to go out of my way to, like, with a higher extent of respect unless you've earned it. Like co- coach has earned it for me. Like I'm going to treat him with the highest amount of respect. But if I go up to some random adult, I'm going to still go, yes, sir. I'm going to treat him with respect, but I'm not going to go out of my way to treat him with the highest respect. Like I do other people. I did not want to diss on yours. I understand yours. No, no, that's totally fine. No, because I mean, it just, and I, I think that's super interesting too, because like, it just depends on culture, like, and where you're from. Like I travel a lot to like LA and stuff. And they have a mental it just depends on where you're at I guess and what they're talking about the situation but a lot of times it's like people have like they don't really respect it just depends but in Hawaii it's like we're taught to like give the utmost kindness like for example like if somebody's crossing like and also respect means different things like respect can be in different forms like I will give people respect to if they tell me something and they never lied to me before, or if I don't really know them and they tell me something, I'm going to take that as, you know, I I trust you. I'm going to give you the respect that I'm going to trust you. And then when I see that they break that trust, now that's going to take a really long time to repair and you have to, you know, know the consequences. But like, you know, in Hawaii, it's like, for example, respect, like respect your elders. Like that's just something that we were taught, but that doesn't mean you don't get to have your own opinion on it is that you respect that they're older therefore they have their reason as to why they believe what they believe but that doesn't mean you have to like have okay. a lot Let's... of different things like for example abortion <laughs> but that doesn't mean i don't respect them. okay let's go to michael here I'm completely unrelated to the to the what the current conversation was talking about. That's okay. The, the first point that uh, I I talked about was uh, uh, I took a quote um, when they were just discussing I think problems in general, but not necessarily uh, focus on Confucianism. They said man being the the animal with uh, without instincts, no inbuilt mechanism can be counted on to keep life intact. Um, which I don't really, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. I think that like, uh, I think like primarily we are like social, like we're social beings. And I think that like society has brought out more of a dog eat dog, more of an individual mindset um, to attain, um, I guess, greatness, if you will, but not really the word. Oh. Yeah, power, etc. Well, remember when Mr. McCullough said that we're programmed both for revenge and for forgiveness? Um, But people disagree on which one, cooperation or competition, is most natural. Um, And then, I mean, okay, so the neuroscientist I read said, if you think about it over time, evolutionary time, The ones who cooperate are the ones who survive, (laughs) right? And so he would say that basically nature selects for cooperators. Um, But, you know, when when people get in desperate situations and they're afraid, well, then they'll uh, attack. But 
I would say the fallback is always cooperation for moving forward because violence doesn't move anybody forward. Um, does that make sense? And yes. Then the next thing is how do you compare the US with China? But anyway, that's just to put on hold for a minute. Um, TM. Okay, so we got me with the, the pre um, video was uh, Confucius Analytics, specifically um, letter C. Uh, let me go to it. Right there. Um, what's there? So it says, you should set up belief in the good old thing. That's not what I said. The good old days? Well, I, I don't remember picking that one, but yes. I could have sworn I picked a different one. Well, I'm sorry. I, I could have sworn I didn't pick that one. I think I wrote the wrong letter. Yeah, yeah I guess. Okay. I mean, yeah. So, there was day, a so. section where he he did that was part of his moral training is to keep referring to the good old days. So, that what was, was kind of caught my eye. What? I said that kind of uh, kind of caught me because I heard I hear that term a lot, and like they kind of refer to good old days whenever like people are relaxed and stuff. So hearing it here, it's like, oh, well, I know it went back that far as that, that term. Well, do African-Americans want to think about the good old days? Yeah. <laughs> Not really. Probably. The <laughs> I consider only, the good old days, like back when we just like, got free, like the era we were yeah. like popping the music, conversation blues, they had. jazz, all that kind of stuff. That would be yeah. considered the good old days for me. Yeah, like the conversation they had while they was picking cotton, that's probably the good old days, I guess. Because, like, I'm not trying to get joking on it, but when when you just pick cotton, I'm pretty sure you have a good conversation. You're just there all day. So you never know. And then well, I, you should think about that because it's a powerful political tool to talk about the good old days. Yeah. But I, as a woman <laughs> uh, in philosophy, uh, there's no good old days. And my life is way more complicated, way more ups and downs than my mother's, but I would not trade it, right? Uh, so, but you have to think about that, right? Um, okay, that's right. How many years back are you going to go? And Confucius went way back. So another question we'll get to eventually is, what do you think of this tool for using the good old days to, for moral instruction? And do you think America does that and it is a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and those are really important questions. But yeah, Jordan, I think we're going to talk about that later. Is that OK? OK, go ahead, Jordan. OK, uh, I mean, we can wait later. No, that's OK. What do you think of the good old days, Jordan? It's bad, like inherently. For many people who aren't straight, cis, and white, um, I mean, that's, I think it's harmful rhetoric because it causes people who uh, think about the good old days, like, as this image of, like, the 60s, everything was, like, better than when in reality, it was just as harmful and there was a lot more corruption and, like, awful things happening be simply because we're at a new age whenever people we're transitioning to actually have better rights. Like women weren't allowed to have credit cards by themselves until I think the 70s, maybe the 80s. Um, so people's autonomy weren't the same back then at all. People want to act like it was just this utopia and it's not. Unmarried women couldn't get birth control until like 1972 or something. It was crazy. Um, Colin. Um, oh, well, one of the things that kind of stood out to me was his idea of like time, kind of like his lifespan. 
uh, first of all, that was crazy that he lived so long to begin with. And like, kind of the ideology behind it, because like, living to 60 and 70, like back then doesn't like, make sense to me. Was it just, you mean the phases of life when he talked about when I was 15 and when I was 30 and all of that? Yeah, but the way that I read it was like, that's the outline for people to try to do and try to follow. Right, it's a, it's a model, it's true. But it's also crazy that someone in the 600 uh be uh ce like living that long like to the 60s and 70s like i don't see people back then living that long in my head most of the time when i think about that people are dying at like 50 60 is living long type idea okay i think a few did but on the other hand you could create a myth about confucius where he lived longer than he did just so you could tell the story about here are the phases of life, right? Because um, they didn't really care as much about facts as they cared about patterns and a model for how to live. Um, okay, Zane, what do you think? Actually, what I was gonna point out, we kind of already discussed, but uh, usually whenever like I look through it, I try to think of like how it ties into like stuff we've been talking about. And kind of like what y'all said about uh, how like the they approach like the situations, you know, like the realist, you know, they're all about power and like showing force and stuff like that. And, you know, Confucianism, they're not necessarily on the soft side, but, you know, they're saying that that's too much. And that kind of uh, like y'all said, it tied into that Oklahoma City or Oklahoma City bombing thing, like where the dad, you know, how the, we had, we're both hardwired to revenge and then forgiveness. And so that's kind of just what stuck out to me and just kind of tied into the other stuff we've been talking about. Very good, Zane. That's great. Um, yeah, please feel free to bring in some of the stuff from the past because we're all, it's always talking about the human condition and it's always talking about a radical shift. Like some of those people had this huge shift in how they looked at the world. So I'm presenting you different views that would require you to have a huge shift, right? It's because this is a huge shift from where we were before. And so anyway, that's how you scramble up your brains and figure out, well, how have I been conditioned? And so when you read about Confucius, you could say, have I been conditioned to be a radical individual? That's kind of the standard stuff in America. Um, or did my family hang together deliberately as a kind of subculture and um, outside of the norm of individuality, or is there some sort of balance of those two? Um, all right, so the first part of the chapter is, um, first of all, civilization is integrating those instinctual drives into culture. And so when, um, when you say, People don't have any instincts. I would, I, you know, I think that's questionable, right? They have an instinct to survive and that involves having sex. So they, they get a lot of pleasure out of sex, also out of hunger, right? Out of satiating their hunger and their thirst. You have to get pleasure out of that because you gotta go, you know, you have to be driven to go find food and find water and find sex or we wouldn't survive. And the other one is, all the dangers and vulnerabilities lead to this trigger of fear. So I would say those things are pretty natural, but culture really has to incorporate that. Otherwise you're never gonna get a civilization. If people always just react on their impulses like that, you're never gonna, everyone is, it's gonna be a very primitive form of life. Um, but the other thing, unlike the other animals, is we have self-conscious awareness. So we can actually be afraid of things like going to hell, you know? We can picture all this stuff in our heads. And I don't think animals are afraid of going to hell. Um, 
we have a lot of other things where you can look at animals and sort of identify with that, especially mommies and their babies. I can really identify with it. But the self-conscious awareness piece is that I'm aware of my relation to my kids. And then I have a lot of choices about it. So Confucius is really concerned for how to structure a society. That's why I'm bringing this up, right? Why? Because he lives at that time of the warring states when civilization absolutely collapsed and people were, right? The enemy was chopping your relatives up and putting it in the soup and forcing you to eat it. I mean, that's about as bad as it gets. Um, so what were the solutions? The first one was force. Now, I, and again, I want you to make analogies with much smaller events in our society, but they are disruptions, right? 9-11 was a disruption, the economic collapse, and now COVID, right? We have these disruptions. And um, how do people respond? because you are going to live in a time where there are going to be more disruptions, climate disruptions um, and uh, pandemic disruptions and Im Im refugee disruptions. There's gonna be a lot of stuff. So what do you think? What kind of leadership are you looking for? Because there will be somebody. Yeah, okay, good. Um, there will be somebody who wants to be the strong man and say, just vote for me or follow me and I'll fix it, right? So can we learn from strong men in the past? Can you read history? Can look at American history? Um, is that a solution? And what happens when the public gives themselves over to a strong man? Well, after about one generation, people don't like being bossed around all the time, right? So it doesn't last. It's a temporary effort, but it really doesn't last. So Confucius is really trying to set up something that will last, and it did last. This is really interesting. It lasted for 2,000 years. So one quarter of the population was integrated into a self into a unified culture for 2000 years. That's very amazing. Um, so he was a social genius, but what did he reject? He rejected force. And then the second one was love. All you need is love, right? Um, so that's why I said with the Sermon on the Mount, in a, in a way, Jesus says in the Sermon, all you need is love, right? It's all about love. And so that's why I said that, um, in the Western tradition, Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, putting your heart in the right place, was integrated with the Greeks, where you have Aristotle's whole big list of virtues and political virtues and social and political weaving together as society in the base of the virtues. <clears throat> so that's why uh, the Western tradition had that particular integration. And then he talked about the founding fathers. And he said the founding fathers were trying to base a whole society on reason. Okay, now I want you to tell me why did Confucius think there was something wrong with that? And do you agree with him? All right. Do you agree with Confucius that the realists were too cynical? Do you agree with Confucius that the all you need is love people were too utopian? And do you agree with Confucius that our founders were just didn't understand human nature, that what really drives people is custom and tradition, but you can't have reason as the foundation because it will then, if you don't also have moral education, the reason is just gonna be calculating self-interest. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, yeah, I was just going to speak on your last point about like, uh, like education not being like the only way, because um, one of the things that 
uh, they added in here was a quote. Let's see. Until recently, the world's leader in education, uh, the United States leads likewise in crime, delinquency, and divorce as well. Um, so, like, that's a pretty clear indication that, like, education is not the only answer. Obviously, those things also have, like, a plethora of other um, uh, things that affect them, but, yeah. I want to agree with Michael all that. It's, I think his point on reasoning shouldn't be the only thing is a strong one, simply because I think without the moral obligation that you often have, uh, reasoning can be just used to justify a number of things that just are justifiable if you morally look at it. It could use reason to be more um, economic based than you are humane based. So I think that that's a good reason. I also believe in what he was saying that love, all you need is love is like a far too utopian view of the world. If love was all we needed, then like all Why would need is love? It's yeah, system. I was thinking about the Beatles the whole time when you were saying that, but like there would be no war because you would simply hug someone and then all the hurt would be gone away. No, there's a lot more factors that go into that, I, but I also don't think that like tradition should be the be all end all. Traditions also harbored a lot of harm in the world, like especially in the Middle East with uh female genet uh, genitalia mutilation. That is a tradition that is extremely harmful and it's continued on and things like that, you know. I actually had a couple of students from Yemen who I think were had their genitals cut off. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tradition. Uh, all right, who wants to go next? Do you agree with Confucius? I can. Okay. Um, on the whole, all you need is love topic question. No, I don't think all you need is love. Honestly, I've gone without love besides my mom for a long time, and I think I'm perfectly fine. I, humans are made to have partners, but love is not all you need. But I do think that some kind of love, whether it's family or a partner, is slightly important though no. okay all right so do you agree that all you need is force this is to get society to work right all you need is force all you need is love all you need is reason i think all you need is reason you think that's all you need well what was but but a like a how do i word this but like love is the force that like moves a lot of people to do things and to fight for certain things. I know that a lot of people in the military, they're in the military for their loved ones. So I know that is something you kind of need in the world. So I do agree that it is something you need. That was where I said Christianity was tied in with the Greeks to link the mm -hmm. heart and the head. Mm -hmm. um, okay, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, well, I think all humans need love. Like, I, I personally feel that way. Uh, and then to get to a utopia, like, you need, like, as we say for the millionth time, like, we need balance. And I think you need love and reason. Like, we're human beings. There's no, like, you can literally look at psychology and see what, see what happens to kids when they don't have love growing up. Like, just look at that. And so that's plenty enough reason to show it and like and then I'm not talking about like when people are like you know 30 years old and they're like you know I'm living my happy life like I don't need kids or like mid 25 like or I don't want a family or a significant other I'm not talking about that like I'm talking about like love means like what Lexi said like family like love from a dog love from a significant other but at the end of the day people do need love like they need care and to know that they're cared about and I feel like that that's something that's within like within us that's in brain and hardwired and given to us by birth it quite literally is there are studies on uh romanian orphanages where the years the uh there's like 30 kids per adult and they grew up extremely malnourished and with uh deficits that could never be recovered simply because they weren't loved enough whenever they were a kid it, they were chained to the beds I don't think, I mean, from the study I read, they weren't, but maybe they oh, were in some cases. I saw some of them sure were because I saw the pictures. 
Cook, uh, yeah, it was a bad situation, but yeah, kids do need love to grow up in like a healthy environment. You can see that in the current system with uh, foster kids. Whenever kids don't have a stable environment growing up, they often have emotional um, issues that need to be addressed later in life. So, okay, um, Tim. All right, so I think the third one sounds good for me to talk about because like custom and tradition, but not not really like you said like uh, what it I forgot what the word you said, but not as to oh man, I forgot the word you said. But custom and tradition, that's that's pretty strong for a lot of people. So like for example, if you were told to do something but no, as far as government, I wouldn't be as accepting. But if our family has this tradition that to do something, I feel like we'll be more lenient to follow it. You know what I mean by that? And then also when they were talking about love, I feel like that's part of it too, because I don't care who you are, love's gonna make you feel better and help you have a better life. Because like people who aren't really loved as much, they're always seen as, more like, I don't want to say dark, but like just more like to themselves, not outgoing, stuff like that. But people are loved, they're more interactional with other people. And you, when you're more interaction, you can get st more stuff done and be more successful. I really just, this is the last one. Okay, so let me just go a little further. Okay, society had totally collapsed, right? And so we're talking about political wisdom as a political leader, not just as a parent, as a political leader, what do you tap into to keep, to regain order? One of them is force, right? And Confucius thought that that was too cynical. One of them was love. And he thought that was too utopian because you might love your kid, but what happens if somebody hurts your kid? Well, then it's a war of all, right? You have to, Love isn't going to be able to fix all your problems or, you know, regain, you, so. regain social order. That's the main thing. Then the third one is just rational, just appeal to reason. But the trouble is people use their reasons to calculate their own self-interest, especially in a time of chaos, right? The smartest people are going to create order for themselves or take as much as they think they need and everybody else is going to be desperate. Um, and then Confucius solution was what he called deliberate tradition. And so he is the architect of a culture and his model is the way to maintain harmony from one generation to the next in the face of various external threats or climate issues in the face of hunger. Um, if you condition people to care about each other, nobody will go, nobody will become desperate. Like this is over time, the way to maintain order and harmony and also well-being. So if the goal of every political leader is to maximize human flourishing, as we've said over and over, then Confucius is considered a social genius. He created this cultural framework and he made himself into this icon to imitate um, that really did tap into people's uh, emotions and their instinct and really motivated them to get along. And it really worked. Um, so what do you think of, do you, okay. I mean, the thing here is that, uh, yeah, well, that's true of anything, Ryan, right? And so, um, so the, the issue I want to get at here is that the U.S. tapped into reason and science and all that wonderful stuff. And Confucius tapped into relationships and culture. Um, and we can, we can think about, you know, which one, 
is um, which one? It's just, it's an open question. What are the pros and the cons? And now, of course, the US and China are, you know, going to be the two major powers in your lifetime. And there's going to be a lot of animosity. But I don't want to talk about the political animosity. I want to talk about the foundations. If you read the Analects, if that was your equivalent of the Bible, right? You read the Analects and you raised your children, you conditioned them to follow all of these protocols and to treat, you know, follow your duty. The child has one way to relate to the parents and one to their elder siblings and one to, you know, and then they gradually become the elder sibling. And so they do this to their younger siblings. So there's all these protocols. And if you fit in, you can have harmony and stability. And so he was able to bring China from chaos into order. So, um, all I want to ask, um, I think it's Colin, Zane, and Alyssa. Um, what were the things you did like about this? And what were the things you didn't like? I mean, just your reaction. Uh, Houston Smith is going to be very sympathetic to everything we read. He always picks out the best parts. So what do you think? Um, where should I start? Colin? Um, well, one of the things that I did like in the reading was the the cake of custom okay mm -hmm. i i think that something that's seen in both societies uh in america by um simply the if you look at the amendments the 18th you can't drink 21 you can't drink they live through their generations and they um started to change as uh, like on a national scale then in China the you can talk about their birth limits I guess is I don't really know the way to call it one child policy yes ma'am um and kind of how that's changed their society a lot um for the better or for the worse whatever you decide it definitely change them because you have these large families from farming because that was a mainly farming and once it became industrial mainly industrial and still relatively industrial and now they're only having one child it kind of changes society a lot but it did lift people up from desperate poverty it yes lifted it did a lot of people up I think 600 million people or something uh, got out of desperate poverty, which is pretty amazing. And if you do that, if your government pulled you out of desperate poverty and created a world where your children are better off and your grandchildren, are you going to be loyal to that government? Yeah. Um... What well, comes to mind for me, uh, especially being from Florida, is the Cubans. Um, okay. There's a lot of old head Cubans that were only vote Republican just because. Uh, oh my God, I'm blanking on whoever made it like allowed them to come over into the country what was a Republican at the time, the president, and I'm completely blank blanking on who it was, and. And also Fidel Castro. Yeah, that too. Yeah, but memories uh, of him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, and that's, yeah, that's another story about the politics in the U.S. Is It's different than this just general look at, do you assume people are equal and free and individual, or do you assume they're social and they need to be woven together? Um, Alyssa, what do you think? Um, I did appreciate, uh, like you said, he points out the more um, complimentary sides of everything. And like it did, to me, make me think of the highlights of how um, the US and China did, you know, go down separate paths. And we've seen success and failures through, bro through both. 
um and like how like here we have the american dream you know you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps make something of yourself and then there it's more obviously about community and pulling the community up and um it just left no oh, i just lost my train of thought um yeah it's much less about personal achievement yeah and more about community well-being mm -hmm. and like um because because of their focus on community well-being there has been like personal achievement within china you know like olympians scientists stuff like that and then in america because we focus on personal well-being there's been community achievements because people have been able to bring up their own communities um and how like they went different ways about it but i feel like they've hit somewhat of the same goal at the same time yeah it i mean the one big thing is the censorship right you don't have free speech in china um because you know look what happens when you have free speech a lot of it is used to polarize right it does undermine community a lot. It, you know, that's what we're experiencing. So, um, Zane, what do you think? Oh, okay. Well, the first thing that like I kind of disagree with when it comes like the foundation of a society and like trying to like create one or like revive one, I don't believe like with or agree with the term of like all we need is such and such or all we need is like power all we need is love i don't think that's the case i don't think there's only one thing that you need i think it, there needs to be like a balance when it comes to it i mean obviously i believe a lot of stuff i mean we need it obviously i think it's required but it's not like it doesn't work by itself there's a lot more that goes into it there's a lot of moving parts i believe when it comes to like the foundation of a society so that's kind of what stuck out to me and kind of what i thought about it okay so the idea that there's a lot of moving parts is that you have to be patient with complexity and ambiguity, right? Right. Okay. Yes, so if, so, I mean, instead of having a position where keep the government out of it, it's always the government's fault, right? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's the law that's bad. Sometimes it's the way it's applied that's bad. Sometimes it's because there isn't a law. Some kind, you know, it's, and the other hand, capitalism is, you know, good or it should be have more free market. And then sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. So um, yeah, that's that's what you want. I just want you to give you the sense. How on earth would you run the zoo? Like when you're complaining about political leaders, you have to step back and say, well, what? do I want? Like, what would I want? You can't just pick at them. You have to stand back and say, okay, what's the big picture? What's the vision of this candidate for if you vote for them? What direction will they try to take the country? I mean, they could fail, but that isn't what you want is what's their vision. And then you also have to find out if they just took a Gallup poll and tell people what they want to hear, or if they really have this conviction, and then you can decide if that actually is the best thing. And it is very hard, I know, to find out what is this politician's real conviction, um, and why do they have that? Is it just because that's where their campaign donations come from, or is this a conviction and is it wrong like they actually truly believe this but it really i don't think history has shown that that works so anyway that's um this is the main issue when we're debating about how confucius rejected the west and chose deliberate tradition just getting your mindset getting you to think about well what's the issue here and um, trying to know that it does matter. There are people who are taking a lot of power in light of a certain vision of where they want America to go. And they profoundly disagree. So I'll just leave it at that. 
Um, well, do you remember with women? Women could run into all these obstacles, but they have to step back and say, the foundational principle behind the oppression is that women are not intellectually equal. So you got to root that out, get it out at the root, and then you can start designing a society, redesigning it, right? Anyway, so that's, that's the way that theme runs through the class. All right, let's go with this. Um, I'm going to read a few of this, these, and then I'll ask you which one you like, and I will tie them to um, Aristotle or Socrates, just so you know, it's the this, this standing tradition, right? The patterns that seem to me to be the same. Um, this would be temperance, right? Self-control in relation to sex drive. Um, the golden rule is just really your reason, your reason's capacity to understand our common humanity. Um, and that's both in your heart, the Sermon on the Mount, and it's also in your head. So you can't even think about political life or the laws or institutions unless you assume this basic humanity. And then you can think about, well, how are we gonna make laws to enable people to flourish? Um, when, when African-Americans were not given that basic humanity, all of the laws were corrupt. The whole political system wasn't really a political system. It was just a set of tools to force people into unnatural situations. Anyway, that's fundamental. Um, personal con uh, conduct, duty to his, okay, so deferential. Okay, is that a good thing or bad? Beneficent, being generous. Uh, and um, in directing them, he ruled for the benefit of the rules, right? He made the decisions appropriate. So what is wisdom? Um, okay, put duty first. All right, now think about that. Do Americans put duty first or they would, would they put freedom first? Or what other options are there? Um, Okay, let's see. The philanthropist is someone who desires to maintain himself. In order to maintain yourself, you have to maintain others. So there's no real distinction between the self and others. The mature adult uh, acquire knowledge and always keep seeking knowledge. Um, okay, this is the virtue of honor. Even though this person acts honorably, he doesn't mind if he's dishonored because he's not going to fight for public honors. This one is clearly living an examined life, like Socrates, and also like Aristotle. It, you, in order to figure out the mean, you have to step back. Well, there's this extreme, and there's this extreme, and then I have to figure out what's the mean. Um, you have to have um, conscientiousness and sincerity, uh, everything in moderation, right? Uh, then there's the different stages of life. I do want, you know, when we emphasize freedom, equality, and individuality, we don't emphasize stages of life. The stages of life one is more organic and the freedom and equality is rationalistic. So you can think about that. Uh, this one is great. This is another Socrates one or, or Aristotle's self-knowledge. Um, okay, so, and it's a balance between um, your un, uncivilized drives and then when, um, you just are civilized to the point that it's rote. You know, you sort of do the same thing every day. So there has to be some combination of uh, novelty, you know, moving forward and then order. Then there's the golden mean. Um, then there's uh, learning from other people. Um, 
not being anxious or fearful. Remember when Jesus said, do not be anxious about what you shall eat or what you shall drink. Um, and I mean, just think about that, that there is so much to be anxious about and Americans are anxious. Um, so these wisdom traditions are, are moral teachings for people who've lived for millennia who really have a lot to be anxious about and fearful of. And so the, the teachings are trying to help people cope with their lives. They don't have therapists and they don't have um, material security the way many of us do. Um, all right. So the wisdom traditions really emphasize strength of mind or, or strength of soul or resilience, right? These lessons are trying to teach you resilience. Um, and then another way to maintain order and um, have a strong character is just to um, follow, you know, follow your duty, uh, respect your parents, um, this is another one where it's the mean between extremes. Um, Confucius character. So this is where to some of it, like, again, similar to Aristotle, you have these sort of definitions uh, or descriptions. And then uh, in the Greeks, you have the example of Socrates and in Confucianism, you have the example of Confucius. Um, he had, um, he was, and his big thing was the good old days. He's transmitting the golden age, right? This is what it really means to be Chinese. So I do want you to clock in on what's your view of the good old days? Do you have examples of people referring to the good old days? Is that healthy or is that basically arrested development? You, that Jordan had a, an opinion on that. But definitely that's the way Confucius Try, created order was this belief that there was the golden age of China. Um, you have to cultivate your character. That's one of your goals. Studying is really important. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Okay, now I'll stop there. So all of those are related to your personal character and your countenance and how you treat other people, how you come across and um, be simple, right? Keep to simplicity, don't have affectations, uh, don't. Okay, so some what a reaction to the analects that are about character traits right personal character traits do americans try to cultivate character do they try to think about propriety and how they come across uh i don't think we're known for this but really you know underneath the surface do you think this is a major driver of American citizens? Uh, Ryan? I mean, I think stigmas, I mean, occur for a reason, stereotypes occur for a reason, but like, look at all of us. I mean, I, I mean, most of us are Americans. And even though people outside of America think we don't have values, we don't cultivate character like I, I mean, at least, the Americans that I met, a lot of them do. I mean, obviously there's going to be a few in the bunch that doesn't, but I'm not going to, I'm not somebody who hates America. Like I'm not somebody who's going to say there's like, just because there's a lot of issues, it doesn't mean that America isn't great. I mean, I, I personally think so. I mean, I think freedom is one of the biggest things for me, um, you know, like religious freedom and freedom, uh, you know, speech, those are things that I think is very important. And so um, I think, America does cultivate character, in my opinion. I mean, bravery, uh, the idea, I mean, obviously there's systemic racism. There's so many exceptions to this. 
that, that makes it hard. But for me, I mean, I was always taught with the idea, like you can be anybody you want, you can achieve anything you want. If you want to go and, you know, set yourself up to go and run for office one day, then set yourself and go and run for office one day. Like for me, that's how I was taught. And that's how a lot of the people I've seen been taught and how I hear. And I think Americans do have a lot of traits um, and character. Like, like I said, bravery, um, you know, the idea of being a go-getter and achieving anything you want to achieve. Like I said, always there's like systemic racism. I'm going to throw it out there. Obviously that's a no brainer, but every country has something like that. So there's every- also classism, right? Yeah. It's- I mean, a lot of different That actually, that's where the Chinese. um, That's where the Chinese come in. You know, they say there's such a huge gap between the rich and the poor. And so because of that radical individualism or the minimal government. But it's fine with me, Ryan, if you want to say this is what you think. But the point of the class is that that's been socialized into you. That isn't by nature that's by culture, right? And so if you'd grown up in China, you'd have a very different view and it would be just as deeply rooted. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? It's just to kind of make you a leader. My what? Wi-Fi, my Wi-Fi kind, kind of cut out what oh. you just- I, Okay, it's just that when you say these things, the point of studying it or the, the lesson today is that that isn't by nature, that's culture. And if you'd grown up in China, you wouldn't think that at all, right? And so that's how profoundly different people can be. Like there's the same clay that we're all made of, but this molding of the clay really causes people to turn out differently. That's just kind of my main point. Um, Jordan? Uh, I was, I've never been more patriotic than whenever someone who's not from the U.S. is shit talking about us, because I feel like there's a big difference between talking about the problems within your own system and then making observations about something that you don't live in. Like, I think us as Americans understand the issues that are put in place. I think younger younger generations are working towards changing that, but it, it doesn't change, like, I'm just reminded of like we talk about British people like we're joking and then they're like well at least we don't have school shootings ha 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 like that isn't a traumatic thing that affects every single student in America I don't that I've had a number of drills and even bomb threats in my school but I just to me what you're talking about is like yeah we're not gonna understand how people live in China because we weren't born there but they're also not gonna understand how right but if you had grown up there, it's just to try to develop some empathy, right? That there is a common humanity even underneath all of that conditioning. Um, and especially since there's gonna be animosity between these two countries. I, um, I did wanna tell you that if you're in China and you know, an American says, I don't respect the Chinese character or something, you know, they're gonna wonder what's going on. Because when you're raised as a little kid, you say, well, that's not true, you know? Um, So there's, that's how you get a lot of misunderstandings. Um, Just to understand what it is, the way you think that's just a function of conditioning and then the way, what's underneath that. Um, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, well, going off what you said, like, I feel like it goes both ways. Like, I don't, I feel like, it's, I'm sorry, this is just my own opinion, but I feel like you're, you're kind of making it like, it's, it's like pointed towards America, like that our values were just conditioned, but China's values were, they had their own opinion on it. Because like, for example, they can say things about our character, but we could say that they have no freedom of speech. Right. I mean, I'm a philosopher, so I don't have any trouble being critical. I just want people to understand, that's all, that you can have this basic intuition and it's actually not totally. Somebody else would have a really different one. That's all. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Um, Michael? Um, sorry, can you repeat your very initial Well, point? it's the idea is, um, okay, you have all those analects, right? Right. And they do have similar virtues. But, but when Aristotle is tied to the Western tradition, it comes out a lot different than when they're tied to the Chinese tradition. Right. So were those any of those that struck you? Oh, um, yeah, so I did like the edu like the one about education, um, just because I think that like, I think to make informed decisions on, like on any, um, about anything, um, these, in, these decisions need to be uh, educated ones, um, clearly. Um, and then I also noted about the cultural one, um, just talking about how like, that can really stem a lot of like um, uh, negative consequences as well, uh, depending on like how um, you treat and um, transpose your culture throughout like history, if you will. Because um, obviously culture can be both good and bad. And I, I, I do understand that you can say that about most anything as well, um, but uh, yeah. Okay. With what, yeah with what you're saying like the united states has a history of imperialism and imposing themselves onto other countries and their governments and that's going to spread a lot of animosity amongst people so their view of america is going to be very negative i think that's very different though than saying americans are ignorant and then they they can't do this they don't understand this i, I think understanding the history of your country but not blaming the people of your country is very important Okay, Tim. I feel like what she has said, that happens a lot because like people can blame certain people, but that's like, like she said, the country, you can't blame a, a group of people for the what the country has done. And like, I also heard about like, if somebody was not from here talking about us, I mean, in, in a sense they shouldn't, but I mean, you can say whatever you want, but you all you gotta take consideration. You don't really know what's going on because I feel some people they look at the problems and always complain about it. But there are, if you really look at it, there are less problems than there are um, good things going on. Like there's a lot of good things that the U.S. has been doing, but the 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 bad thing they just want to dwell on it so much. Like I'm not I'm not saying you're I'm not saying they're. Um, this I'm not saying they're not taking um I forgot I don't know I forgot what the word's called whenever you have something but you're not um thankful for it. Oh I'm thankful I think yeah some people are just like ungrateful kind of but I mean there are problems yes but you shouldn't be too so ungrateful to where you always talk about the bad always talk about the bad like you have a lot of good stuff going on right now. I mean it's good to talk about the bad but not to where it's like a lifestyle. That's just what I think. Colin, was there one of those analects that struck you or anything? Um, I really don't know what to say. Uh, Did it surprise you? I mean, he has the golden rule. He has uh, the same thing Socrates says. He has the golden mean. Um, Can you come back to me? Oh, sure. Alexis? So um, I'm German. So I don't feel like I kind of have the right to talk about America in a sense. But I have lived in America for a good chunk of my life. And I have lived in other countries as well. And personally, on how I see America, now I'm not not dogging on it. The America, it's America, but I'd rather be in any other country right now. <laughs> I'd rather be in any other country, to be honest. Why? So a lot of my family 
have been so thankful they have raised their kids in any other country besides Russia. They or just, Saudi they, Arabia. Like they'd be, they'd rather raise their kids in any other country. And I, again, I'm not dogging on America. Well, why? You know? Why, Alexis? Because they feel much safer raising their kids anywhere else. Okay. They feel more comfortable anywhere else. They feel like the health rights and the benefits and the way they can raise their kid in any for say for per like for example, I'm German. If I could if when my mom raised her me and my younger sibling in Germany, she felt like she had way more room to take care of her kids. My sister now, she's raising my four-year-old and my two-year-old nieces. She'd rather be raising them in Germany just because of the benefits she could, she is missing out on raising her kids in America. Right. That my little niece is four years old. She, she turns four in August. She gets to go to school now. I've sat in my bed and cried thinking about my niece going to school here in America. I shouldn't have to feel like that. I shouldn't be scared for my niece. Um, okay. So some of that is um, social that they have more taxes and more services, right? Um, so they're sort of in between. They're in between China and the US. They have more of a balance of mm -hmm. social programs, social concern for the well being of others, as well as individual free speech and all that wonderful stuff. Yeah, that's right, Ryan. And so the thing is, you want to, there are pros and cons for everything, law, but I mean, you can make distinctions, right? So, yeah. I mean, you want to learn how to run a society. You want to learn how to lead. You want to learn how to head, you know, where you would want the country to go. And so you can learn from studying this stuff. Um, so that's my main point is you don't just say, oh, there's pros and cons to everything. You just, what are the pros and what are the cons? And is there always examining yourself and your own society? You always have to examine your society. Yeah, I was understand. Like I'm trying to, I'm understand that a lot of people would rather be in America and grow up in America and be raised in America. I completely understand that. I was just saying, from my personal standpoint and how I have seen everything and how I'm seeing the current stuff and the past stuff. That's what I'm saying. Like everyone's experience is different. And I'm saying from my personal experience, again, okay. I'd rather be. That's um, from someone who's lived in like six different countries. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, someone who's lived gay in the South, it's not the most welcoming atmosphere. You know, I've been called pretty much every name in the book and it's really hard to find communities, especially in that area. But I still love living in America as much as I hate America it's because I love living in America that I want to see an improvement and I feel like okay. if we just leave it all behind and like we're okay. just like whatever then we can't actually improve anything right and then you have to define what does it mean to improve right and then guide in that direction right so equality based on sexual orientation would be one direction you want the society to go, right, Jordan? Does that make sense? I mean, the reason why there's, there are people who want it to go the other way. So it's controversial, it's not a given. Is that, is that fair? What do you mean by that? What do you mean? It that you, you think that social evolution you think that you would want us to get more and more inclusive that would be the john stuart mill attitude i do think that america has amazing room to grow and like i i get what you're saying like um how america is we want it to be better we want to push it and how like it has the it has the power to socially improve upon grades but it's like how it is Okay, I need to get Alyssa and Zane in there. Go ahead, Alyssa. Um, <laughs> man, that was just a lot. Um, so, um, like, I understand the importance of the golden rule, 
um, and like how valued it is through Confucianism. But I think it's just as valued like here in America, especially like at least in the South. Like, you know, I live an hour south of Houston, which is one of the most um, one of the most diverse cities in the country now. Like it is I mean, it's just incredible how diverse it is here. And like, I'm so grateful for living near Houston because of that, because I've been um, like, we treat everyone, you know, how we would want to be treated. And because of that, like here in America, we've been able to be introduced to so many other cultures, like within an hour's drive. Like I live in a very, um, like I live in a very heavily like Latino populated area. But just 20 minutes down the road, there's like a Vietnamese colony. That's what they call it. Like there's a lot of Vietnamese people. There's a lot of Nigerian people. And like, it's just, I just feel like we value the golden rule just in different ways than like in China. Okay. Um, good. Um, all right. So so the the takeaway is how do you want to form the society or what direction would you want a leader to take america at this point in time that's that's all i'm asking uh for you to think about that's that's it and also i mean reading confucius analects you i mean i would hope that you'd read it and say well this makes sense i mean this is a wise saying. This wisdom literature is um, pretty universal. It's just that when you take it with you out into the world. So for example, I can like a Confucian Analect, but I assume that I'm treated equally when I try to follow through on these things. Whereas, of course, women were not treated equally under the original Confucian in the Confucian society. And so you have to say, well, does it still have any legitimacy? Um, or just because of the way the society was structured that none of these insights is legit. And you can think about that too. So, and then how to rule well, all right? If you govern the people by laws and keep them in order by penalties, that would be force. They'll avoid the penalties and not be ashamed, right? But if you govern them by your moral excellence, keep them in order by your dutiful content, conduct, they'll retain their sense of shame and they'll live up to the standard. What do you think? Do we look to our politicians to, um, for moral excellence? Um, are they people we want to imitate? Are they people we respect? Um, is that because um, they really have always been power hungry, greedy people, and now they manage to get into politics? Or because they really do want to rule for the sake of the rule, they really do want to have a middle class? Or, you know, I, I don't know what people think of their political leaders, but um, Confucius definitely had this image of the cultivated leader. The leader is a cultivated person. Um, let's see, doesn't act for his own interest. Um, let's see, okay. Don't be concerned about lack of position, right? Don't fight for power, but be concerned about um, what, how, what kind of a person to become, how to develop the practical wisdom so that you would be able to step into position of power. The essentials of government number one is to maintain the confidence of the people. So again, you can think about how much of the polarization of our country is because the pol political class no longer has the confidence of the people. And then how would it regain the confidence of the people? What can the political leaders do that would uh cause you to to have some confidence in them or some of them um let's see there should be no need for capital punishment uh, because again that's just trying to govern by fear um 
here's another really important one, not to use rhetoric, not to use words to, to um, manipulate people or hide the truth. And this was what destroyed Athens, was the teachers of the best and the brightest taught rhetoric, how to be persuasive. And so all the people with power or aspired to power knew exactly how to punch people's buttons. Um, and that's a really corrupting influence. Um, let's see. And then with culture, the appreciating poetry and music is really the sign of a cultivated person. And you can't really be a good leader unless you also have, like, you're a cultivated person. Um, what do you guys think of um, Confucius' image of the good leader as a cultivated person? Um, Jordan, what do you think? I think a cultivated leader has been different from like historically. I think I, one thing I don't like about the United States is that how religious everyone needs to be in order to run for office. Like there has not been a single non-Christian president the entire time we've had okay. uh, elections. And I think that in that sense, it makes it really hard for people with other religious viewpoints. I mean, now we've had one of the very first few uh, Islamic and uh, woman senators. I think that uh, what we need in a leader has advanced a lot more. And with like different centers coming in place, it is less to do with like, oh, they just look good. Cause that's a lot what politics used to be. It's more about like what their policies are. And I appreciate that shift. Okay. Michael? Um, are you just referring to our thoughts on the Captain today, Lear? Just the idea that you have to be a cultivated person. You have to, you know, set a moral example. And it doesn't mean saying you're Christian, right? That's a big problem, right? You just say you're Christian. Our thoughts and prayers go with so-and-so. And, -so, and right. then that's just a whitewash, right? right. I mean, he wants the oh, person yeah. really... To, to internalize a lot of these virtues and right. to present himself that way publicly. What do you think, Michael? I'm, I'm gonna kind of pick it back on Jordan. I think part of the problem is that we have used um, like religion and specifically like Christianity as a means to like, li like to get votes, for example, because I would wager that many presidents who claim to be Christians were not. Um, however, that is like, I feel a political tactic um, to keep people on your side, um, even though you don't necessarily have those moral obligations. Um, but also we've, we can see that uh, religion and Christianity in specific um, can be used to kind of um, warp those moral obligations into whatever way you see fit for your own uh, regard, whatever you want to accomplish. Um, sure, yeah. religion is used to discriminate against non-binary people, for example, is that virtue, right? Is that moral excellence? No. Yeah. Uh, Tim, do you think a leader should have integrity and lead by example? Um, yes, we shouldn't. I'd be a good um, leader for people to want to follow in a way. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, obviously the abortion issue is that people present themselves as religious and so they have to make it illegal. But people also present themselves as religious and say, you have to have mercy on these women that suffer so much. You can't. I think it's easier to talk about it when it's not your body. I think that's why. When it's your body, it's way, it's, it's way more components to come with it. But if it's not your body, I mean, they gonna, they can talk whatever they want, but they're not physically feeling what they're talking about. Especially like, for example, if you were to get like sexually assaulted or something like that, you have a, if you get pregnant, 
you should not have to be forced to keep that baby. That's not that's not right. But how it is now, you kind of gonna have to. So it's like, and they can talk about that. It's like, oh, they they want to keep the population, but that's kind of dumb because it's not your body. You don't know what trauma that can bring to the child or the mother. Well, the thing, the point here is that politicians present themselves as super religious in order to make abortion illegal or maybe keep it legal, right? Is that leading by moral example? Is that what Confucius is talking about? It, it, or is that just creating this appearance okay. in order to get votes? Yeah, okay. Well, so that, you know, that's what I'm kind of getting at is that I think I'll hold off Ryan for a minute so I, I can um, call on some of these other people. Um, Zane, do you think, I mean, do you think politicians should set a moral example? Zane said he was um, at dinner listening oh, in. Oh yeah, that's right, that's time. right. Okay, um, Colin, do you think when politicians start trying to present themselves as having moral integrity and virtue, is that just a whitewash, get it out of here, I don't want it's a distraction? Or do you think when politicians just present themselves as I don't know, rational calculators or power, or you know, somebody you wouldn't even want to be friends with. How do you think that they should, you know, present? How can they lead by example? I mean, personally, I've worked with a lot of people who are like calculators. Um, I wouldn't want one ruling over me or like having like, a lot of authority over me like a house or mainly a senate rep or like a president like I wouldn't want that personally I'd want the person to have some sort of emotion and some sort of feeling um but Trump did present himself as Christian right yes so you have to remember that you know and a lot of Christians voted him because they thought he was the candidate that God wanted for some reason or other. But in my personal opinion, a lot of those people who vote based on just purely religion are slowly dying out. I know that's a bad thing to say, but it seems to be like we're on the tail end of that. In my opinion, I think religion, religion is still like a strong suit, especially like in the Bible Belt. But I don't think that's the overall like card that people will start to play in the future. I think it's going to change. Okay, that's interesting. Alyssa and Alexis, is that it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Alyssa. Um, it is important for our leaders to have like you know moral codes, like moral obligations, but like. I, I think throughout history, but more visibly in recent years, having like that moral code through Christianity gives them leeway to throw logic out the window at times. And they're like, well, I'm doing it in the name of God. So it's okay. It doesn't matter that it goes against logic. And that's where I think it gets dangerous. Okay. And then Alexis. I think that a person who is trying to run a country should run, should campaign on what their mindset is and what they truly think because if they do that and they actually get elected and they then they're speaking the truth they're going to do what they actually believe in but if you I'd rather someone lie I'd rather someone tell me the truth and not get elected because that's not what the people need or want than lie and say this is what you want to hear most likely not going to do it what if they promise something and then they can't get it through because other powerful people won't let them is that their fault or no, but i feel like if you truly try enough it's gonna show okay um all right so i think you know let's see ryan did you you want to speak 
I think my main point is I think Americans seem somewhat confused about what it would mean to lead by moral example. I don't know. I mean, that's my impression. It's definitely not like the Confucian. Confucian, the history of Confucius, is Mao sort of remade himself into, into Confucius. I mean, and now she is, is stepping up. And the articles that you read for next time, he is stepping up and trying to take, take on that role of Confucius. It's very interesting. But go ahead, Ryan. Oh, I was just going to say that I think leading by example means being consistent. And so like if the politicians who was Christians, like I think leading by example would be placing laws. I'm not saying it's right, but in their opinion, I mean, in their mindset, placing laws such as abortion would be cultivating and leading by example because they're placing those laws. But I don't think it's genuine because if they were trying to lead by example, they would be consistent and they're not consistent because they don't care about immigration. They don't care about stricter gun laws. So I don't think it's consistent or genuine. I think they pick and choose. And that's why I well and what they want. Okay. So I think there's a difference between not caring about immigration or gun laws and not being able to get anything through. Um, but I don't, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to really. I don't know if somebody deliberately says they care about it and they really don't, which that happens too. You take a Gallup poll, tell people what they want to hear, and then you don't do it. Sometimes you really want to do it. And because of the other political issues, you can't do what you want to do. Does that make sense, Ryan? I, I'm referring to like when politicians, like for example, I'm not for or against Trump, but I'm saying like, for example, he said like, immigrants um, will bring more destruction to America and that they're drug dealers. I consider that not really Christian values. But then if you go in, but I'm just making an example and some people, Republicans believe that and they're the same Republicans that say that abortion is through the Bible. So that's what I mean by being consistent because it's okay. not Christian values. On right. <laughs> that's why I think I wanna conclude that we're very confused about on the one hand, we definitely need politicians that have strong, strong character. But on the other hand, we're very confused about whether we want them to talk about it or not, because talking about it itself can be a corrupting influence. Does that seem fair? Um, because it's, go ahead, Michael. I'm gonna piggyback off of Ryan's point. Um, yeah, so like with like the, the Roe v. Wade thing, um, I don't know if you guys have seen the like current news article about the woman from uh, Texas, I think it is, who was driving in an HOV lane, um, who is pregnant, and she got fined like $450 uh, because you're supposed to have two passengers, but according like to the law, like that is now uh, like a child. And so like, uh, I'm pretty sure she's like taking it to court um, that, if, if that is how the law, like just talking about consistency, again, getting back into the talking about consistency, like even if it is wrong, if you are going to have these laws based on these things, they have to be consistent all the way around. Right. Okay. Yeah, there's just going to be so much stuff. It's really incredible what's going to happen. And um, okay, well, to me, what... Uh, okay, for me, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer and all this stuff is, uh, you know, the abortion is a lot of human suffering. And there's, and no denying that, but underneath this, there are people that are really taking advantage of it to get people not to be thinking about how money is sticking to money. But that's, you know, that's me about a middle class but all this other stuff is really, there's gonna be a lot of women suffering a lot. And I'm sorry, but I, I do care about that. Um, all right, so next time we're going to focus on the political stuff. So there's the second reading, 
is um, 16 pages. And then I definitely want you to read the Founding Father's view of Confucius Analects. It's, it should blow you away. And I definitely want you to come with a comment. Um, and then there's some news articles about the latest ruler in China and the way he talks and things like that. You should be able to spot that right away that he knows his tradition and he's punching the people's buttons. So uh, I, think, I think it's interesting considering, you know, it's just a couple hours of your life to read this stuff, but it is connected. So when you read a newspaper article, if you've just read a little bit about Confucius, you know, Houston Smith and some Analects, you can get what's going on at a much deeper level than if you hadn't read it. Otherwise, it's just facts. There's no context. So, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Does anybody, okay.